Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm Margaret Mims from the Department of Learning and Interpretation here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Tonight's talk is the second in the three-part series celebrating uh, amazing Houston women and the extraordinarily significant roles that they played in building the collections here at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. And I think equally as important, their visionary roles in laying the foundations for the vibrant cultural, intellectual, and civic life uh, of the city that all of us call home. Our lecture series here is part of a larger citywide celebration of women organized by the Houston History Alliance to champion the many ways that Houston's women have, are, and will put their mark on local, national, and global history. This citywide collaboration is called Tales of Houston Women. It includes 21 organizations throughout our city. Uh, we're just one of them. All of these uh, organizations are creating programs that provide their own perspective, perspectives on how Houston women, women changed their world in relation to their organization. So there's this wonderful little flyer that the Houston History Alliance produced. It was outside on the table. If you, I hope you picked one up. It's a celebration that began in the middle of September and it goes to the middle of November. So I hope that not just our, our lecture series, but that you'll join in some of these other celebrations too. Last Thursday evening, we kicked up uh, off our three-part lecture series titled Amazing Houston Women and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston by turning our attention to the early 20th century and a remarkable woman named Annette Finnegan. Next Thursday, October 25th, our focus for our final lecture will be I'm a Hog. Our speaker will be David Warren, who in 1965 became the first curator of Bayou Bend. I'm a Hogs Home, which she had just given to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston to become a House Museum of American Decorative Arts. David would work closely with I'm a Hog for the next 10 years as a, until her death in 1975 to help transform the home into a house museum. He then served for three decades as director of Bayou Bend Collection and Gardens and just two years ago published his book long in the making, I'm a Hog, the extraordinary cultural patron behind the unusual name, which celebrates Miss Hogg's legacy. So I hope you'll join us next week as our series continues. Our focus this evening, though, is Audrey Jones Beck. When Audrey Jones Beck died in 2003, the Houston Chronicle reported, quote, she was best known for the namesake Audrey Jones Beck building at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. I think all of you know the building right through the tunnel and across the street. And for her personal collection of impressionist and post-impressionist paintings, which she donated to the museum, end quote. But there's so much more to her story, and I'm very pleased this, this evening to welcome author Stephen Finberg as our speaker. For many years, he's written about political, environmental, and social issues for magazines and newspapers. But his greatest and still continuing, I think, project is his work on the life and the legacy of Jesse Jones, who was Audrey Jones Beck's grandfather. Stephen's journey into the life of Jesse Jones began in 1992 when he was hired to write a biographical sketch about Jesse Jones for Houston Endowment. Houston Endowment is the philanthropic foundation established by Jesse Jones and his wife, Mary Gibbs Jones, in 1937. What began as a biographical sketch of Jesse Jones led to a massive archiving project of Jones' personal and business papers, the Emmy award-winning documentary, Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? The Story of Jesse Jones, narrated by Walter Cronkite, which Stephen wrote and produced. Stephen's fascinating book titled Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism, and the Common Good, which was published by Texas A&M University Press in 2011. And most importantly to our focus this evening, a long and close friendship with Audrey Jones Beck, who worked tirelessly to further the vision her grandfather had to improve the quality of life for the citizens of Greater Houston. So this evening, Stephen shares his many insights about Audrey Jones Beck, the woman he knew and loved and misses, the lively, civic-minded Houstonian, the philanthropist, the art lover, the animal lover, and so much more. 
Following Stephen's talk, and I'll say this again later, you're all invited upstairs to the lobby of this building for a little reception where we'll have Stephen's book about Jesse Jones for sale, as we did outside the auditorium, as well as the catalog of the Beck Collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist Art here at the museum that Audrey Jones Beck herself compiled in 1998. But now please give Stephen Finberg a big welcome to the lectern. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for coming. It is such a, a pleasure and an honor for me to be here tonight to talk about my dear friend, Audrey Beck, who I think is one of Houston's most unsung heroes, who made profound and singular contributions to both the visual arts and the performing arts in Houston. Um, I'm going to start by, we're going to step in the way back machine for a second so I can tell you a little bit about her family, where she came from, who she was, how she became the person she was. Her great grandparents, Louisa and M.T. Jones, came to Houston in the 1870s when maybe about 20,000 people lived here. But they knew they would only succeed if their community prospered. So they were constantly nurturing their community while MT was building his business. Uh, Louisa and MT were founding members of DePelchin Faith Home, which we now call DePelchin Children's Center. They were founding members of St. Paul's Methodist Church, which is right across the street from us now. And when MT Jones passed away, not long after, Louisa, donated all the bells that are in the tower over there at St. Paul's, and there's a plaque in the sanctuary lobby that says, to the glory of God and to the memory of Martin Tilford Jones. This idea of enhancing one's community transmitted through every generation of the Jones family. And first, after I've told you about this, MT, I need to let you know that he was what was called back then a double ender which meant he was vertically integrated. That's what we'd call him today. He had timberland throughout East Texas. He had sawmills to make the timber into finished products. And he had lumber yards throughout Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana to sell the finished products. He also had 6,000 acres along Buffalo Bayou where he raised grain and cattle. And I show this picture on purpose because it's going to enter our story a couple more times, and in fact, in a very important way a little later on. But first, I'm gonna have to tell you about the scandal in the family. And it's okay, Audrey told me I could do this when I first met her in 1992. The, the trouble was that Audrey called Jesse Jones her grandfather. But Jesse Jones never had any children of his own. And finally, somebody came up to me and he asked, he said, well, did Audrey arrive here by immaculate conception? Tell, tell us the story. And I was really not permitted to discuss it at the time, so I went to Audrey and I said, listen, can, I, can we make this public? And she said, oh, for God's sakes, of course. The big scandal was a divorce, which just didn't happen back then. But M.T. and Louisa had a son named Will. And Will married Mary Gibbs, a doctor's daughter from Mahaya, Texas. And it was not a good union. But even so, they had a son named Tilford, who would become Audrey's father. So all the family lived together in what Audrey fondly called the boarding house. This was a big mansion at Maine and Anita, when uh, the streets just south of downtown were lined with mansions like this. And it was a huge house. This is what is now Midtown. But all the family lived there at the same time, including Jesse Jones, when he came to Houston in 1898 to manage his uncle M.T. Jones's estate after M.T. passed away in 19. Uh, excuse me, in 1898. So Audrey also told me, she said, and that's when the spark started to fly between Jesse and Mary, because Mary was very unhappy in her marriage to Will. So in order to tell this story, in addition to the pictures, I've selected some passages from the book I wrote that Margaret mentioned, Unprecedented Power, because really I write better than I speak. So here's something that will help tell the story about Mary, Will, and Jesse. And this is in 1903, and Margaret uh, alluded to the fact about how 
exceptional it was to travel back then, especially internationally, and Mary and Will and her family were going back and forth to Europe almost every year. This is 1903. Despite their extraordinarily glamorous life, all was not well with Mary and Will. After arriving in Sicily from a cruise to Egypt and Israel, Mary wrote to Jesse, do you still intend to come over this summer? I shall be so glad to hear from you any time. The any was her emphasis. She signed it, much love, Mary, and included a postscript about her son that read, Tilford still speaks of you to other little boys as being the strongest man on earth. He thinks you are a wonder. So did Barry, evidently. Two months later, she wrote from London, quote, I am very brave here. You know Will does not care for opera at all. I hope you will decide to come to Europe this summer. I know by August you will require a good rest, won't you? But there wasn't really anything they could do about it because divorce was really out of the question back then. So Jesse went about his business. He was building Houston's tallest buildings at the time. He built the three tallest buildings, each 10 floors tall in 1908, 1909. President Woodrow Wilson asked Jesse to come to Europe and head one of the major divisions of the American Red Cross during World War I, in which Jesse Jones was responsible for creating field hospitals throughout the battlefields, ambulance networks, and canteen services for the men overseas. So he was gone a lot of the time. But by 1919, Mary finally got her divorce, and Jesse returned to Houston in 1919 as well. And one year later, they finally got married. And as soon as they did, they took off for New York City, where Jesse Jones was accumulating blocks of land in Manhattan, where he would build co-op apartments on Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, and some of the tallest buildings in the town at the time. And they loved the performing arts. And if I can find this quote, here's what Mary wrote in her diary from that period of time that they had attended within just a couple of months, 32 plays, five operas, and two concerts. They loved their life in New York City, but there was only one thing that could bring them back to town, and that was the birth of their granddaughter, Audrey, Be Audrey Jones at the time. And so here's what I wrote about that. Home life helped bring the Joneses back to Houston. Mary's son Tilford and his wife Audrey had their first and only child on March 27, 1922. They named her Audrey Louise Jones in honor of her mother and her great-grandmother Louisa. Audrey was Mary's first and only grandchild, but also Jones's first cousin twice removed. Despite the complicated ancestry, the three became so close that Audrey frequently said she had two sets of parents her own, and Jesse and Mary. By the time she was 18 months old, they all had nicknames for each other, which they used throughout their lives. While still learning to talk, Audrey started calling Jesse Bods and Mary Munna. For better or worse, the Joneses called her the baby. And those names really did stick throughout their lives. Audrey was with her grandparents more than her own parents, and she had rooms, here is where the Joneses lived, in the penthouse of Jesse Jones's Lamar Hotel. You can see the Metropolitan, the Lowe's movie theaters, and I'm now dating myself. I went there as a kid to the movies. I took a bus downtown, enjoyed those movies. But Audrey lived with them at the Lamar Hotel in their penthouse apartment. And she also lived with her parents at their home in Deepwater, which was part of that 6,000 acres I told you about right at the beginning. But that's still not the important thing about that 6,000 acres. But Audrey lived there and had a great time. She had a great life. And the Joneses included her in just about everything they did. Here she is when she's six years old. And she is showing off a ring her grandparents bought for her to thank her for being a co-host unofficially of the 1928 Democratic Convention, which was held in Houston. Jesse Jones was the finance chairman of the Democratic National Committee, and he almost miraculously erased the party's debt in time for the 28 Convention. And back then, this is how so much has changed. Back then, 
they decided in January where the convention was going to be held that June. Now we do it, you know, two years ahead of time. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars for these conventions, all really with the same intention, to find a nominee. So the party was so beholden to Jesse Jones that they decided they wanted to have the convention in Houston in 1928. Trouble was, there was no hall big enough to hold the 17 to 20,000 delegates who are about to come to town, and Jesse Jones said, no problem, I'll have one built, and he did. It was made out of wood, and it was located where the Hobby Center stands today. But this just gives you an idea of the kind of background Audrey had. The Jones's house guests were former First Lady Edith Wilson, who was a very dear friend of the Joneses, particularly Mary. They studied Spanish together to see who could learn the most, the fastest. They played bridge together. They really had, had a very close relationship. And Jesse's good friend, Will Rogers, was their other house guest. And Audrey would tell me great stories about her experiences with these people. And she said, you know, when Mr. Rogers would come over for a visit, I'd give him a cup of coffee. And by the time he left, he'd hand me that cup of coffee back and it would be completely full. He hadn't touched it because he had talked the whole time he was there. And I'd say, but Mr. Rogers, you haven't had your coffee yet. And he would tap her head and said, that's okay, little girl. I'll drink it next time I come over. And this was one of Hollywood's biggest box office stars telling this to Audrey. So uh, about a year after the convention was held in Houston, the stock market crashed and ushered in the Great Depression. And Houston, as usual, was buffered from the worst of it because of oil, cotton, and timber, and also because of Jesse Jones. In 1931, Mr. Jones realized two banks in Houston were about to fail, and he knew if they failed, there would be a domino effect across the state of Texas. So he called all the bankers and the business leaders to his office, and he orchestrated a rescue effort that resulted in no banks failing in Houston during the Great Depression, and it was due to Jesse Jones's leadership that that happened. But President Hoover caught wind of what Jesse Jones had done in his community, and he liked it because it was community-based, it was volunteer-driven, and President Hoover had started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation the last year of his term, thinking that if he, the government made loans to insurance companies, banks, that it would restore confidence and the economy would turn again. Well, we all know that did not happen. It only got worse. So when he started the RFC, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, he asked Jesse Jones to come to Washington and be a member, the Democrat, on the bipartisan board. And Jesse Jones agreed, and the Joneses moved to, to Washington, thinking they'd only be there for a short time. However, when Franklin Roosevelt was inaugurated as president, he made Jesse Jones the chairman of the RFC. And that's when Jesse Jones became the most powerful person in the nation next to Franklin Roosevelt, which is somebody, something most people don't know. But it's established fact. It's in all the major magazines of the time. He was on Time Magazine cover twice, Life Magazine, Saturday Evening Post, and they all said the same thing about him. Next to the president, Jesse Jones is the most powerful person in the nation. And Audrey was part of this, too. Here's a picture that the president sent to Audrey in 1935 and said that she is the new G woman and signed it the commander in chief, Franklin Roosevelt. Now, a G man was what we would now call an FBI agent. And that term had been popularized in 1935 uh, in a movie starring James Cagney called The G Man. And I thought it was really cute that, you know, he sent her this picture. But that he also was, you know, didn't call her a G man, he called her a G woman. And Audrey was with the Joneses as much in Washington as she was in Houston. And Jesse Jones was responsible for saving the banks through the RFC. The RFC saved hundreds of thousands of homes, farms, banks. It built aqueducts and tunnels. And the most remarkable thing about it is it made money for the government and the taxpayer while doing so. And Jesse Jones was enormously busy. He could not attend every ribbon cutting, every dedication ceremony, so he frequently would send Audrey in his place. And here they are in Washington, D.C. She's with her grandparents. And here she is christening the Green Diamond Train. 
which was at the time the fastest train ever made in the United States and it had been financed by the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. So here's a little passage I wrote about that. Illinois Central officials invited Jones's granddaughter Audrey to christen the Green Diamond in Chicago in 1936. While her parents, grandparents, and thousands of others eagerly watched 14-year-old Audrey Louise Jones smash a bottle of champagne across the nose of the most modern train in the United States. Audrey, a perfectly poised young lady, rode the train with her parents to St. Louis and took part in the national broadcast. Jones was delighted with his granddaughter's role in the important event and wrote, quote, your letter written on the green diamond when you were traveling at the rate of 110 miles an hour indicates that you were enjoying your trip. You acquitted yourself credibly in the part you had to play and made all of us quite proud of you. He then reminded her if she had not done so already to send thank you letters to all who had extended courtesies to her and to her family. And I purposely wanted to quote that passage because throughout Audrey's life and as long as I knew her, I was always receiving the kindest handwritten notes from her as I know anybody who knew her did if they did the slightest thing for her. She was always the first to drop you a note and let her, you know how much she appreciated what you had done for her. Two years later, uh, before Audrey graduated from Kincaid, she went to Europe with a group of her friends. And this is in 1938, just months after Hitler had marched into Vienna and taken over Austria. Well, the Joneses were quite alarmed about this, so here's what I have to say about that. Despite the turbulence, European travel evidently was still safe for Americans in the summer of 1938. The Joneses' 16-year-old granddaughter, Audrey Louise, was headed to England and France with friends and a chaperone after school let out. Her grandparents decided to follow her wherever they went. Jones wrote John Nance Garner, who was vice president at the time, quote, after planning a little vacation in the West, Mrs. Jones and I finally decided, or rather she decided, that since Audrey Louise was with a party of girls her age in England, we would go to England. So here we are aboard one of the biggest ships afloat, the Normandy. So Audrey went to Europe, and now I'm gonna quote what she wrote about that trip. And this is from her 1998 catalog. It was a pivotal trip for her and for our community. This is, these are Audrey's words. My romance with Impressionism began when I first visited Europe at the age of 16 as a student tourist, complete with camera to record my trip. I paid homage to the Mona Lisa and the Venus de Milo, but the imaginative and colorful Impressionist paintings came as a total surprise. Work by these avant-garde artists who had rebelled against the academic tradition of the day were scarce in American museums at that time. For me, they were not only the epitome of artistic freedom, but also a visual delight. I returned home with many pictures, but none taken with the camera. My images were museum reproductions. And that's how Audrey's interest began in collecting the art that graced the museum's walls today. So she graduated from Kincaid in 1939, and the speaker that evening was James Baker Sr., uh, the former Secretary of State's father and the son of Captain James Baker, who was a very dear friend of Jesse Jones's. And I was particularly intrigued when I discovered that because I'm very proud that James Baker put a cover endorsement on my book even though two renowned Democrats graced the cover of my book. So here is what James Baker Sr. had to say. School trustee James A. Baker delivered the commencement address to the class of 12 and their families. Events around the world and at home were on everyone's mind. Baker said, quote, in these days of international strife, there is too much hate in the world. Dislike and distrust hinder us from attaining the ideals for which we strive. He told the graduating seniors, unfortunately, wherever you go now, 
we find criticism of Catholics, Jews, Protestants, Germans, and of our government itself. Such censure does not solve our problems. We need to build and not to tear down. The 12 young people were graduating into a world shaken by economic distress and violence. And at that time, Jesse Jones and FDR had shifted the RFC's focus from economic, uh, from domestic economics to global defense. And Jesse Jones was responsible through the RFC of building all the factories that would manufacture the trucks, the trains, the tanks, the airplanes, the synthetic rubber, the high octane gas, all that were required for the allied forces to fight and win World War II. And once again, Audrey was at the center of all this with Jesse Jones. She went to Mount Vernon College in Washington, D.C. After she graduated from Kincaid, she spent a lot of time with her grandparents, went to the White House with them uh, to make social calls on the Roosevelt's. But once again, Jesse Jones was incredibly busy and he couldn't go to every ship launching or every plane that left the field. So he would send Audrey. And here, and she would also spend time in Washington with her grandmother and Edith Wilson selling war bonds in the RFC headquarters. But Jesse was very proud of his granddaughter and was glad to send her out to help launch ships. So here she is in Beaumont, Texas, and this is what I wrote about it. This will be the last quote from the book. Planes, tanks, guns, and ammunition were slowly beginning to roll off U.S. assembly lines, and this is in 1941, while new cargo ships were being launched from shipyards across the nation. Jones's granddaughter, Audrey, a sophomore at the University of Texas at Austin, she had transferred the next year to UT, stepped in and christened the Cape Lookout in a ceremony at the Pennsylvania shipyards in Beaumont, Texas. The 410-foot cargo ship slid down the ways into the Natchez River on more than 7,000 pounds of banana peels. <laughs> I know, they cost less and they work better than Greece. Jones wrote his granddaughter, quote, Munna and I wish with all our hearts we could be with you at the reception this morning in your honor and at the shipyard where you are to sponsor the launching of the Cape Lookout. Be careful of those bananas, worlds of love, bods. So you see, these names stayed throughout their lives. So Audrey was at the University of Texas and not long after she enrolled there, she went to the opening of the Officers Club at Corpus Christi, and there she met John Beck. So the first time Audrey showed me this picture, I was so taken with it, I said, Audrey, were you two the most beautiful couple in town? And without skipping a beat, she said to me, no, dear, we were the most fun. And I think they were. They were a very lively, very popular, enormously attractive couple. You can see that. So about a year after they met, they had the first military wedding at Christ Church Cathedral in downtown Houston. And Jesse Jones served as uh, John's best man, and Tilford walked Audrey down the aisle. Now, even though Audrey was a married woman by this time, she was still devoted to her grandparents and they to her. And this is from 1944, after Jesse Jones has become Secretary of Commerce, and he still had that position as chair of the RFC, which really gave him unprecedented power. He was the only person to hold two government offices at the same time, and that's why I named the book what I did, Unprecedented Power. But I thought this was so cute. From the Secretary of Commerce in the midst of World War II, he calls her Dear Baby, those names still persist, as ever, Jesse Bods Jones, and then he handwrites, Mana also sends love. They were just completely devoted to each other and loved each other throughout their lives. Jesse Jones passed away in 1956, and Audrey's Mana and her father Tilford passed away in 1962. And now here comes the 6,000 acres on Buffalo Bio. So you've seen all these members of the Jones family, Louisa and MT, they were the original owners of the land. It then went to Will, their son. Will willed it to his son, Tilford, and Tilford willed it to Audrey. And soon thereafter, 
John and Audrey began to sell the land because it had now become the heart of the Houston Ship Channel. And they transformed that 6,000 acres into the paintings you see on the walls here at the museum today. And they just leapt into this whole idea of creating a student collection of Impressionist and Post-Impressionist paintings so that people could come and see a survey of the entire period and see the best of whatever they could find and afford of the major artists of their time. Now here's another quote from Audrey and her catalog. These are her words. During World War II, art was forgotten for a Navy pilot, John A. Beck, whom I married and followed from assignment to assignment. After the war, we returned to Houston where John became a successful businessman. Although he had little interest in art, I told him of my dream to collect a representative group of Impressionist works for Houston. Needless to say, John at first thought his wife had gone quite mad, but my enthusiasm must have been contagious. He began to manage the business end of my project and soon became vitally interested in what I was trying to achieve. We worked together to tell the story of Impressionism and hope that everyone who views the collection may find in it his or her special painting. And here's another thing that kind of motivated John. So here was this glamorous couple in Houston, Texas, and the auction houses in New York knew that they were kind of like the social hub of the city. So when they were gonna have an auction of paintings, they would ask the Becks if they could please hang some in their home as a preview and invite guests to come over. Well, this happened year after year after year, and John began to notice that each time the paintings came back to the house, they were getting more and more expensive, and the businessman that he was, this really got his attention. So the Becks together began this amazing collection. They started in 1963 by buying seven paintings. In 1964, they bought Van Gogh's The Rocks. Now, I don't want to demean the paintings by assigning monetary value to them because they're far beyond what their monetary value might be. But it is interesting to know what the Becks paid for these paintings because it gives us an idea of what their priorities were and also what the art market was like back then. So for this Van Gogh, they paid $245,000, which would be about $2 million today. They bought a Signac for $66,000, or about $500,000 today. In 1965, they bought six paintings, including the Van Dochen, which is on the cover of their catalog. For that, they paid $39,000, which would be about $300,000 today. And they also bought that same year the exquisite Matisse, the lady in the purple coat. Now, here's some, or woman in a purple coat, sorry. Um, now here's something most people don't know about Audrey. She painted and she was good at it. And one of the things she would do when she would buy a painting, she would set it up in front of her and she would copy it. And there were so many copies of her paintings that she made and they were really good. And John Beck would take them to his office and he'd hang them up on the walls. And finally somebody said, John, this is gonna put your whole collection in question, which is a forgery and which is real. You've really gotta stop showing these pictures. And indeed, that's what happened. They quit showing them all together, but Audrey continued to paint a painting. If she bought a painting, she copied it herself because she wanted to get an idea of what the artist was thinking, what the artist was doing. And so much was happening in Houston at this time. It was really evolving from a post-war boom town into a sophisticated urban center. And there's physical evidence of that everywhere during that period. And it really started right here at the museum when it opened in 1958, Mies van der Rohe's Cullen and Hall. What followed was in 1961, the Manned Spacecraft Center opened. In 1963, the Humble Building opened. It was the tallest building west of the Mississippi. In 1965, the Astrodome opened. And in 1966, the same year the Becks bought this magnificent Duran, Jesse H. Jones Hall for the Performing Arts Open. 
Now, this Duran, from what I understand, and I'm not an art expert, but this is what I have been told and, and what I understand, this is the artist's masterpiece and a signature work of the Fauve period. And the Becks always went for the very best they could find. And this is really a knockout picture that is a, just a, a beautiful piece in the Beck collection. But as involved as Audrey was with the visual arts, she was also involved with the performing arts. The Houston Ballet and the Houston Grand Opera were established in 1955, and Audrey was a founding trustee of both of those organizations. She was a trustee of the Houston Symphony, and here she is handing a working key to the front door of Jones Hall to Mayor Louis Welch during one of the opening ceremonies for the hall. So when Jesse Jones passed away a few months before that time, he said to his nephew, John T. Jones Jr., who he was as close to as he was to Audrey. John was like the son he never had. Audrey was like the daughter he never had. He said, John, remember, Houston needs a better performing arts center. And indeed, did we ever. We had the music hall, which had a leaky roof. It, next door, the Shrine Circus would perform, and you'd hear booming cannons and all kinds of noise coming through the thin walls during you know, the most evocative times of a symphonic performance. And we also had the City Auditorium, which is where Jones Hall stands today. It was built in 1905. It was not air conditioned. It was infested with rats, but yet it hosted everything from opera to wrestling. So Jesse Jones knew Houston had to have a better facility if we were going to become a world-class city and to accommodate these great performing arts organizations that were just starting to begin. So the Jesse H. Jones Hall for the Performing Arts opened in 1966. It became home to the Houston Grand Opera, the Houston Ballet, the Houston Symphony, and the Society for the Performing Arts. And that building gave these organizations the foundation they needed to grow. And that is in large part what helped Houston become such a robust center for the performing arts. And the, they kept collecting and collecting. Uh, here they are, there are very few pictures available that show them at home with their pictures. And this is really a crummy picture because it's so soft and it doesn't show you how bright red the top of that building is. This is the De Vlamink that they bought in 1963. And from Audrey's dress, I think this is the night the opening of Jones Hall occurred and before they went out. And here is the Modigliani in their living room. And you can tell they really liked Christmas. They went after it big time. And they had all these magnificent paintings at home, but they would invite students and scholars to come in at all times to look at them, to talk about them, to study them, and to learn from them, and to enjoy them. But then tragedy struck. The paintings were loaned to the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., and during that time, John Beck had a heart attack in 1973, and he passed away when Audrey was only 51. When it was time to bring the paintings back home, Audrey did not have them come to her house. She had them come here to the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, where they have been ever since. And Another little known fact about Audrey is that she loved animals. And here she is with her dog, Impy. And I'll tell you another little inside secret about Audrey. She loved this dog so much, when he died, she had the dog cremated and had the funeral home store his ashes so that when she passed away, the dog's ashes could be mingled with hers before she was buried. And that is indeed exactly what happened. And here she is with raccoons at her home in Belvedere, California. And this was the coolest cottage that was right on San Francisco Bay with an unobstructed view of the Golden Gate Bridge. It had been built originally by the man, Joseph Strauss, who designed the Golden Gate Bridge. And the Becks loved to spend time there. But she loved animals, so much so that when Houston Endowment made a grant to the Houston Humane Society in the late 1990s, the Adoption Center was named for Audrey Jones Beck. So there is more than one building in Houston that carries her name, and this one has to do with animals. So Audrey continued to collect. I would say that in the 1960s, the Becks probably bought about 35 paintings. John passed away in 73, and 
Audrey basically doubled the size of the collection. She had acquired the best that she could find of the major artists, and she turned her attention to lesser known artists who were equally as talented as the ones that we know better. This is a painting by Kupka. And when she started buying these pictures, it's when we started our friendship. And so I would get a little, you know, call from her and I'd get a little inside information from her about what she was thinking. And she said, oh, Stephen, I bought a picture of the most lascivious man. And she just was crazy about the picture. And one time I said, Audrey, what makes you decide to buy a painting? And she said, I say this to anybody who wants to collect art, buy what you love. That was her motto, buy what you love. Then worry about the price. If you can afford it, great. But the first and foremost, buy what you love. So, and here's, here's something else I thought was really fun. She was very close with Harris Masterson, who lived just a matter of blocks from her. And Audrey had this big, long, brown Cadillac Eldorado. It was really old. It had a vinyl top, so you know how old it must have been. And I don't know what it was about this family, but they like to name things. So they called this big brown Cadillac the Hershey Bar. So whenever she would get a new painting, the museum would first send it to her home so she could enjoy, enjoy it, look at it, probably paint a copy of it. And, but what she would do, and I don't know if the museum knew she did this or not, but it's okay now since she's gone. She would put the painting in the back of her car and she would drive it over to Harris Masterson's house, Rienzi, which is now part of the Museum of Fine Arts. And the two of them were probably dressed in caftans. They would drink champagne, smoke cigarettes, look at the painting and talk about their lives. They were just devoted friends. And after they were done, they'd put the painting back in the car. Audrey would drive it home and she would live with it for a little while longer. And then finally, the museum would come and pick it up and hang it on the wall. Another picture she bought, not too, shortly before she passed away uh, was this by this Flemish painter, and I don't know if I can say his name correct, Afanapool. And when we were looking at this painting together, she said, you know, I just don't know how to pronounce his name. And I said, well, I can take care of that. My partner, Harry, is Flemish, as is this artist. I said, let's get Harry on the phone and he'll coach us on how to say it. And so he taught us Ifanapool, and Harry's right there. Do I have it right, Harry? Ifanapool? Okay, there you go. So he taught us how to say this artist's name, and it's just a great, great picture. So here is Audrey at the groundbreaking of the Beck Building, which I think, despite her incredible life and all the things that she did, was really a highlight for her. That's Jack Blanton, who was president of Houston Endowment at the time and her very dear friend. Here are her cousins, Melissa, whoops, sorry about that, uh, Melissa Jones, Stevens, and Jay Jones, and they, just like the rest of the Joneses, have followed in the footsteps of their ancestors and have done everything they can to enhance their community. Melissa served on Houston Endowment's Board of Directors. Her brother Jay followed her and he's now the chairman of the board of Houston Endowment. And he's also on the board of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Here is Audrey at the opening of the Beck Building and she is hugging Ralph Moneo, the architect, and I don't know if you can recognize that guy, but that's me. <laughs> I had the great honor at Audrey's request of being her escort to both the groundbreaking and to the ground, uh, the groundbreaking and to the grand opening of the Beck Building. We had a glorious time together, and it was a great honor and a privilege for me to be there with her. The last picture Audrey bought, she never got to see. She did not live long enough to enjoy or to have it come to her house. This is by Ripple Ronai. Audrey passed away in 2003, and she had a very small funeral at her request. There were about eight of us there, and thank goodness, one of her nieces brought champagne and glasses where we all toasted Audrey and remembered her, which is exactly what Audrey would have loved. And she just is an amazing human being. It has been my privilege to talk with her about her with you tonight because she did make such profound contributions to our city and to our cultural arts. And I thank all of you for coming here today and learning more about Audrey. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I think we might have a few minutes for some questions, if anybody has questions. Anybody? Yes, sir. When you talk about how 
with that, I'm going to loan you to you, or with that, I'm going to loan you to you? Uh, the question is, uh, when the paintings came back to Houston, was it with the understanding they were on loan to the museum or were they a gift to the museum? Is that correct? They were, it was kind of a mix of both. Uh, it was uncertain at the time, but it was her intention that they should stay at the museum. I believe, and I, I don't know if I have this right or not, they were formally given to the museum in the 1990s, but they resided here, and she, anytime she bought a new painting, it came to the museum. It, they never went back to her house. What she had there instead were posters, which was quite amazing to see printed posters all over her house when you knew she had the real thing. <laughs> Anybody else? Two questions back there, yes. Yes, that's a great question. Hi, Susan. Uh, yes, uh, when the Becks got married, it was spelled B-O-E-H-C-K, and they shortened it to B-E-C-K. How did you know that? Oh, okay, okay, good, 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 very sharp. <laughs> and you have a question? Oh, that's a great question. What happened to all her copies of the paintings? Uh, she uh, willed them to her friends. They, all her friends have a painting by her. And uh, she had a lot of friends in California where she had the house in Belvedere. And I know that's where the Matisse ended up, or the, let's say, the Matisse. That's, <laughs> that's where it went. <laughs> and yes. So the question is, did Audrey buy her art in Europe? And how did she f find the paintings that she decided she wanted to buy? She poured over catalogs. And she bought paintings in Europe and in New York. Uh, she, she and John traveled all over. And they were so popular at these uh, auctions. Because you know they were just glamorous. And they were beautiful. And they drank champagne and had a great time. And they were kind of the center of attention. Uh, but they bought all over the world. and. Audrey would just get on the floor with these catalogs and pour through them until she found a painting that she thought fit the intention of her collection, was to make it a student collection. And the museum, since she passed away, has added five paintings to the collection because Audrey left money for them to do so when appropriate paintings became available. Did they have children? No, they did not have children. They had dogs <laughs> and paintings. Any other questions? Yes. When you say student collection, what, what precisely do you mean by that? Uh, what do I mean by student collection? Those were Audrey's words. And she called it a student collection because she wanted the best of this period of art to be available for students, scholars, anybody who is interested in an encompassing survey of Impressionism and post-Impressionist paintings. So she called it a teaching collection, a student collection, because she wanted she didn't have a lot of paintings by the same artist, she would have one or two of the best she could find and afford so she could display the whole period of time to whoever wanted to come and see it. And that's why I think she took such a great interest in the lesser known artists from that period because she wanted to give them some play as well. Anybody else? Yes. Ooh, quite, what a question. <laughs> uh, the question is, uh, her grandfather was a Democrat. What were Audrey's political leanings? And I would say they were pretty much in line with her grandparents. She might have been a little bit more conservative than they were. But I would say Jesse Jones was very, and Mary Gibbs Jones, they were very progressive. They were funding scholarship programs for minority students, African Americans, back in the 40s. They uh, advocated for women's right to vote back in 1915 through their Houston Chronicle. So they were progressive-minded people, and I think Audrey is very much the same. Very open-minded, very liberal, and uh, especially when it came to social issues. Anybody else? Well, thank you again. This has been great. I hope you enjoyed it and learned some insights about Audrey. Well, truly fantastic. And in answer, a uh, little addendum to the question about the student collection, it's my understanding that Audrey thought of her 
collection is being a little, or paintings is being a little bit like arranging a dinner party because you know all of these artists knew each other. And so she would find one here to sit next to this one to sit next to that. And you could see all the relationships between them. So, and you should know about the Beck collection. It, it, it stays on view. It's not allowed to travel. So these, we get requests for these paintings all the time from other museums. They cannot travel and they're all hung together. So and unless uh, a work is out for conservation or, or to have something, uh, it, you can find all those paintings up in the gallery. So we hope after our book signing and little reception tonight that you will, uh, which will be right above us, just one level up in this building, that maybe you'll make your way over to the Beck Building and take take a look through those galleries. And they're painted peach color because that was a country color that Audrey saw on a gallery, in, I think, in Paris, and she liked it very much. So it's an intentional color at her request. That's why those galleries are painted peach. <laughs> so if you're in the Beck Building on the second level, it starts in Gallery 222 and goes through 226. Those are all the, the Beck. You can't miss it because they're all peach colored walls. <laughs> but I hope you'll join us. Stephen Upsey. Thank you again for a wonderfully energetic talk. We really learned a lot. <laughs>